Hey, welcome. So glad you're joining us uh, here at the Norton Grace uh, campus online. My name is Dan, one of the pastors, and love the fact you're checking in with us. Uh, if you're a dad out there, happy Father's Day. If you have a dad, uh, make sure you give him a call, send him a card, uh, buy him a gift that he doesn't need. I don't know, do something, but happy Father's Day uh, to all the dads out there. Hope you have a great day. Uh, one, one quick announcement, I just want to let you guys know, uh, if you're in the vicinity, uh, our Bible camp for kids is coming up. It's coming up June 26th through the 30th. Love for you uh, to bring your kids, or if you got kids that you know, grandkids, uh, nieces, nephews, whatever it might be, send them to Bible camp. Love the opportunity to hang out with them that week. Uh, shine the lights bright on Christ. We're in a series together, and uh, this series is found out of Galatians 5. Grab a Bible. You have a Bible or get it on your phone. Uh, you can follow on the screen if, if that's better for you. Uh, if you're driving, just listen, okay? Uh, here's what it says. Fruit of the Spirit, all summer, fruit of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. Talked about that last week. Let's not become conceited. That's what happens when you're not in step with the Spirit, provoking and envying each other. Father, I'm asking that you would help us today to hear from you and that we would allow the Spirit of God to move in and move out what he desires today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, Pastor Aiden, the little guy, uh, he started a brand new series, a uh, series on the fruit of the Spirit. And for some of you, uh, he mentioned this, and I thought this. Uh, you grew up in church, maybe you grew up in Sunday school, maybe you grew up going to vacation, Bible school, and a song came into your mind, you know, the fruit of the Spirit's not a coconut. Uh, if you want to be a coconut, uh, it's not the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is and they go through the whole deal, right? It's love, joy, peace, patience. And many of you uh, tuned in. If you didn't, you ought to go back and check that out. You were encouraged, you were challenged by what Pastor Aiden shared with us. Um, if you were not able to uh, tune in for that, uh, let me tell you some of the top five or six takeaways from last week to get us ready for today. First is this, first big takeaway, and if you were tuning in last week or you were here last week, uh, the first takeaway is Aiden is an awful driver, and that is true. I've ridden with him one time. One time, uh, he truly is an awful driver, but he's a really, really good drummer. That was a takeaway from last week. And uh, apparently that's all he did in middle school was drum. He told us that story, right? But the truth is, the truth is he used that illustration to say the Holy Spirit keeps tempo in my life. And so keeping in step with the Holy Spirit is the same as abiding with Jesus. And he kind of he kind of sets the tempo. Uh, one of the takeaways from last week was the way he sets the tempo and the way that I stay in uh, the same step with the Holy Spirit is I yield to the Spirit and then I kill my sin. I don't tame my sin. Uh, and then I cultivate a friendship with God. He taught us that last week. It's not the Holy Spirit getting, it's not me getting more of the Holy Spirit. It's actually the Holy Spirit getting more of me. That's what it is. Yield to him. Don't try to tame my sin, kill it. And then I'm going to cultivate this friendship with God. Uh, he talked about this, that when it talks about the fruit, it's fruit, not fruits. This isn't a checklist. Hey, I'm doing great. I got seven out of nine, right? But this, they all go together. And we're going to see that. We're going to look at them one at a time, but they all go together. And, and, and that fruit is always something that's for the benefit of others. You never see an apple tree eating its own apples, right? And the truth of the matter is that the fruit is always for the sake of giving it away. And, and the thing that struck me, and if you weren't here last week, this was a big takeaway. Uh, what Paul does is he contrasts the fruit of the Spirit with the acts of the flesh. The acts of the flesh are, are simply coping mechanisms uh, for our life uh, apart from God. It's the way we cope with life apart from God. But the fruit of the Spirit, here's what it is. It is manifesting publicly the character of Jesus that is being formed in us privately. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. Now, the Holy Spirit moves things in and out of my life, and he forms in me the character of Jesus in a way that Christ's likeness emanates from my life. Uh, we said it this way, it's more of Jesus, less of me. Uh, you and I are becoming more and more every day um, something, Either more of Jesus or, or we're becoming more of us. Uh, we're becoming more joy-filled or we're becoming more cynical. We're becoming more generous or we're becoming more stingy. We're becoming more peace-filled or more anxiety-filled. We're becoming more patient or becoming more intolerant. Uh, we're either becoming more forgiving or becoming more bitter. We're becoming more like Jesus, more like me. 
As I walk with the Spirit, or maybe we could say it this way, as I abide with Jesus, he moves things in and out of my life, and my life begins to produce the fruit of a life that looks like Jesus. Uh, so here's what we're going to talk about today. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is, say it with me out loud, what? Love. Probably not a big surprise, right? Right out the gate, Paul says that when I keep in step with the Holy Spirit and allow him to form the character of Jesus in my life, it produces the fruit of the Spirit. And the first thing he mentions in that description of the fruit of the Spirit is love. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, Tina Turner died. Did you know that? <laughs> you know? Yeah, and one of her fam famous songs that she sang that she was known for was called what? Do you know what the name of it was? Yeah, I hear you. What's love got to do with it, right? What's love got to do with it? Well, when you look at the Bible, apparently a lot. <laughs> apparently a lot. Paul mentions love first, and when you look at the Bible, it mentions love a lot, and it appears to be very, very important. Let me just show you. This is really, really quick, <clears throat> but it seems to be a very, very important thing to God. Uh, first thing is, when Jesus was asked what's the greatest command, he said it's all about love. He said it's love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, first and greatest commandment. The second is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. He said, all the law and the prophets hang on that. Like, like it's the greatest commandment, love. Uh, here in the book of Galatians, Paul is talking about that. He said, the only thing, look what he says, that counts is faith expressing itself through what? Love. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, are called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, Right? Rather, serve one another humbly in what? Love. For the entire law, sounds like he's quoting somebody here, is fulfilled in keeping this one command. What? Love your neighbor as yourself. Seems to be very important. Not only that, Jesus said it's the mark of a disciple. Uh, he told his disciples, John 13, a new command I give you. What? Yeah. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple. If you love one another. It's like the mark of being a disciple. It's like the greatest command. And then we can say it's the greatest virtue. He says at the end of the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, he said, these three things remain faith, hope, and what? Love. But the greatest of these is love. Uh, love has a lot to do with it, apparently. But when you really like lean into Tina Turner's song, this is not a sermon on Tina Turner, by the way, we may get some idea where we tend to get off the rails because her song goes like this. What's love got to do with it? What's love got to do with it? What's love but a, do you know the words? Second, don't sing them, right? I won't, I promise. Uh, what's love but a secondhand emotion? What's love got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Uh, Tina Turner begins to give some definition to what she, and I would suggest many in our culture, think love is. Love simply a, a something we can fall into and we fall out of. Love's a feeling. It's a second in emotion. But here's what I want you to know. When Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, he could have used several different words for love. Uh, he could have used the word storge for love, which was an affection between people. Uh, a lot of times it was used love between family members. He could have used the word phileo, phileo, phileia, uh, a love between two friends. He could have used the word uh, eros, which simply was this romantic, erotic love, a love between a married couple. But he didn't. When he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, he uses the word agape, and when he used that word, it is the love that God has for us. It is an unconditional, roll up your sleeves, put your work boots on kind of love that stands in direct contrast to what the world sees and thinks regarding love. If you're taking notes, here's I think what he's saying. Spirit-filled love, and I'm going to just put that in there, agape, stands in direct contrast to my self-focused love. Love is mentioned first. And I think that's interesting that love is mentioned first in a me-first world. Now, now, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I probably don't need to make a case that we live in a self-absorbed world. Could, will you agree with me on that? We are a selfish people. Uh, we are preoccupied with ourselves. Anybody ever heard of the selfie culture? Right? Uh, I love my cell phone. makes things really convenient. Love it. But we live in a selfie culture. Uh, a culture that is 
taking pictures all the time of themselves, and every picture has them included. I, I saw these statistics, 92 million selfies taken every day. <laughs> uh, it says this, individuals spend 54 hours a year, that's over a work week, uh, seven minutes a day taking selfies. On average, uh, selfie taker is about 24 years old. Uh, women are about one and a half times more likely to take selfies than men. 2014 was declared the year of the selfie. And just in case you didn't know, today, uh, this weekend is Father's Day, but June 21 is National Selfie Day. 43 people, this was fascinating to me, die every year taking selfies. More people die while taking selfies than by sharks. It's interesting, right? Uh, we, we're, we're preoccupied with ourself. Uh, one author, Will Storr is his name, he's the author of Selfie, How We Became So Self-Obsessed and What It's Doing to Us. He traces the selfie culture to the self-esteem movement. Uh, he said this crazy idea came about in the late 80s and early 90s, and it said this, in order to free ourselves from all the social problems, everything from drug abuse to domestic violence to teenage pregnancy, we just had to believe we were special. We're amazing. But what he goes on to say is this, instead, this philosophy filtered into a parenting style that created impossible expectations for the children who were raised with it. And when they fail to meet these expectations over and over again, they enter the state of despair that can manifest all kinds of self-destructive behaviors. Like we have this selfie uh, culture that kind of uh, bends in on itself and it lends itself to self-destructive behaviors. I think it's not only uh, our self-absorbed, self-love, self-focused culture. Uh, it's probably seen in many different phrases that we use. The phrase, you do you. You just do you. Uh, you're in control of your life. Self comes first. Do your thing. Do what you think is best. You do you. Uh, it's reflected in lives who follow this principle. Are you too anxious to go to work today? You do you. No worry. Just take the day off, right? Uh, Paul says the fruit of the Spirit stands in direct contrast to the acts of our flesh, which are predisposed to being self-focused, predisposed to being self-seeking. They're predisposed to being self-protective ways of coping with my life apart from God. That's what he says. That all those acts of the flesh, you can peek back up at verse 19, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, faction, envy. It's like they're all fruit or they're all things that come as a result of a self-absorbed, a love that has been in on itself. I think it's interesting when Paul talks about the last days, a lot of people like to talk about the last days. He says this, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be, say it with me out loud, what? Lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness but denying its power. And he says, have nothing to do with such people. It's fascinating. One pastor uh, that I heard this week actually pointed out that this preoccupation with a self-filling, self-focused, self-promoting love is actually satanic in its roots. And I thought that was interesting, so I kept listening. And he quoted the founder of the satanic church. And the founder of the satanic church, Anton LaVey, said this, we don't worship Satan. We actually worship ourselves using the metaphorical represent, representation of the qualities of Satan. That's interesting, isn't it? Satan is the name used by Judeo-Christians for the force of individuality and pride in all of us. I find that fascinating. St. Augustine had a concept of this kind of love. He, If you want to take this note, I don't have a slide for it, but he called it incurvatus. I heard the same pastor mention this. St. Augustine's concept of love is in curve vetus, a love that is curved in on us. We focus on selfish wants, our selfish desires, uh, self-focused needs, self-promoting agendas instead of on God and others. Love, he goes on to say, was meant to be given away, but what happens is, this is what happens when it turns in on us. We become lovers of ourselves. We, we, we even love other people in an effort to love ourselves. 
The truth is, sometimes even our involvement in religious endeavors can be motivated by self-focused love instead of an agape, God-centered love. Uh, we can, as Paul said, have a form of godliness and deny its power. Uh, Paul said in another place, he said, uh, I might do an incredible things religiously. I, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but don't have love, I'm just a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm just annoying. <laughs> I might speak with eloquence. I might speak incredible, like have the voice of an angel, speak in the language of angels, right? But I'm just going to sound like a, a, a gong without love. If I have the gift of prophecy, and, and I can preach, and I can share God's word, and I can insight in our culture, and I can fathom mysteries, and I have all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but don't have love, I'm nothing. Like, those are pretty big deals, right? It's not like this guy's a slug. He said, if I give all, I, if I, give all to, I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, right? I'm a martyr for the faith that I may boast, but don't have love. I gain nothing. You see, apparently love there has a lot to do with it. And what Paul says is the fruit of the Spirit is love, agape. And he says that this agape love stands in direct contrast to a love that's bent in on itself, a love that is self-focused, a love that is uh, self-protective, a love that has a self-promoting agenda. So the question is, well, how in the world does this kind of love get produced in you and me? If you're sitting with somebody, turn to them and say, that's a good question, right? If you're not sitting with somebody, just say it out loud to yourself. That's a good question. Uh, what is it, how does this happen? And then when it does happen, what does it look like? Let's just spend the rest of our time answering those two questions. How in the world then do I produce this kind of love? Fruit of the Spirit is love. How do I produce that kind of love that would be part of the fruit of the Spirit? And then when I am producing it, what does it look like? Next 20 minutes, let's just talk about that. First, how in the world does my life begin to produce this kind of love? Uh, do we just go away from this? Story? I'm going to go love people more. I'm just going to grit. I'm going to I'm going to do it. Is that what I do? Or, or, or do I leave this sermon and maybe I feel really, really guilty and that guilt inspires me to somehow love people better and more? Is that, is that what happens? Listen, listen, you cannot, listen close, you cannot produce this kind of love by grit. Not going to do it. The fruit of the Spirit can't be produced just by grit itself. Sometimes you might have to grit your teeth, but it, it, that's not how it's going to be done. And, and, and guilt's never going to produce this. Here's why. Just, just think about this. Just do the hard work thinking about this. Both guilt and grit will actually produce a self-focused love. If I leave this sermon and I just grit it out, or I just leave the sermon and I go love people because Pastor Dan made me feel guilty today, here's what I'm doing. If, if I'm loving you because I felt guilty because I heard a sermon, I'm loving you primarily to alleviate my guilt, which is actually primarily a self-love. I have a self-interest in that. Or, or if I just leave the sermon, it's like Pastor Dan told us, and I'm going to go show, and I'm going to show the world that I can love this way. What am I doing? It's a self-promoting kind of love. I'm going to show you by my grit that I can love the way that you just told me to love. So how in the world do we love this way? How in the world do we produce this kind of love? Let me show you a couple passages. It's going to be all over the place. If you want to turn there, you can. Ephesians 3, I love this. Paul's praying. He says, I pray that you being, what? Rooted, key word, rooted and established, grounded in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And then to know this love that surpasses knowledge, like to know it, to experience it. Why? That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I love that wording, right? Uh, if you're taking notes, I want you to write it down this way. Spirit-filled love, agape, is the fruit of being rooted and remaining grounded in God's love for me. The secret to producing fruit has everything to do with your root. A life rooted in the love of Jesus will produce the fruit of the life of Jesus. Now listen, listen. This is not a sloppy, sentimental, love you, bro. Love you. 
type of love, but it is a love that is demonstrated and I would say defined by Jesus and it's shaped by the cross. And the way that this love is produced is a bit counterintuitive. How do you and I produce this kind of love? By rooting and remaining grounded in his love. And do you see what Paul says? He said that that love is a deep love. It's rooting my life in the deep love of Jesus, recognizing that my salvation is rooted in the deep love of Jesus. I remind myself daily of the depths that God went to to save me from my sin. Romans says it this way, that God demonstrated his deep love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. I'm going to root myself and ground myself in the wide love of Jesus. That my acceptance is rooted not in me being some stellar individual, but it's rooted in God's love for me. Not anything I did, not anything about what I bring to the table. And I remind myself daily that it is his love for me that accepts me, that invites me, and that love is open to all. People who are like me and people who are not like me. I'm, I'm going to root myself and remain grounded in the high love of Jesus. That my identity is rooted in God's love. That I am who he says I am. That the high love of Jesus says he exalts us to the heavenly place. He Literally, we are seated with him at his table. And he calls me his son. I am a trophy of his grace. I am a masterpiece in his hand. I am a child of the king. I'm going to root my life and ground my life in the long love of Jesus. You know what that means? That my security is rooted in the love of Jesus. That the book of Romans says nothing can separate me from. Here's what the book of Romans says. Who shall separate me, us, from the love of Christ? Trouble? Nope. Hardship? Don't think so. Persecution? Famine? Nakedness? Danger? Sword? I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life, angels, demons, present, future powers, height, depth, anything in all creation, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, stay with me on this, guys. Can you imagine what it would be like for us to live our life rooted in this love, grounded in this love, walking into every circumstance, every relationship, every meeting, every situation, every conflict, into your school, into your family, into your friendships, into your neighbor's backyard, knowing that you are forgiven, knowing that you are accepted by God in Christ, knowing that you are who he says you are and knowing that there is nothing that can and will change that. Can you imagine how that would free you up to serve and love others? The reason we struggle loving is because many times, we talked about this two weeks ago, we walk in with this emptiness inside of us that needs to be filled. And so I need people to fill that tank. But can you imagine being rooted and grounded in the love that God has for us? The sense of the fullness of God is what, is, is what Paul said. That as you grow every day, understanding that that love is bigger than you today, I understand that love is bigger today than I even thought it was yesterday. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life splashing around in the ocean of God's love. Can you imagine how that would change the way you walk into every circumstance, meeting, relationship, conflict, tense situation. Can you imagine? Uh, John had some things to say about this. Uh, verse 7, chapter 4, 1 John. He says, dear friends, here's our word, let us, what, love one another. Why? For love comes from who? God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. That's, that's a bold statement. If you know God, what he's saying is this. If you know God, you'll love people. But if you don't love other people, then you don't really know God. You might know about God, but what he's saying here is you don't know God. Wow. Wow. Uh, to be rooted and remain grounded in God's love for me is to love people more and more. 
And if I do not love people more and more, maybe I'm not rooted and maybe I haven't remained grounded in God's love for me. Because love comes from God, and then he says God is love. It is, it, it, he is love. It, it's not just that he loves, but it is such a part of who God is that it's like God is love. And what he's saying is, I might know the Bible, but if I don't love people, I don't know God. He's saying, I might know religion, but if I don't know, if I don't love people, he's saying, I don't know God. He, he's saying, I might know theology, but if I don't love people, he's saying, I don't know God. That's what he's saying. And then look what he says. He just keep reading with me. He says, this is how God showed his love. So first of all, God is love. And then he says, God demonstrates love. He says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. So what's the definition? A lot of people are saying God is love and, and then they put their definition. No, no, God gets to define if he's love. God, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He said, that's what love is. It's a demonstrated love. It's a defined love, and it is always defined at the cross. God's love is not a sentimental, sloppy, secondhand emotion, but it is a substantial, demonstrated love that shows up at the cross. You ever wonder if God loves you? He showed you at the cross. New Testament writers, when they speak of God's love, they point to the cross, the the death of Jesus, the burial and resurrection of Jesus. John goes on to say this, dear friends, since God so loved us, since, since, since we are loved, we ought to love one another. Like when, when the reality of God's love for us sets in, sinks in, and we sink and, 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 and root our lives in that, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. He said it's an indication that God is living in us. Loving others is not simply a matter of trying harder, but it's a response to being loved by God. I heard this illustration from one of our campus pastors, Pastor Tony Livigny. He's talking about one of his kids got a little action figure that they were excited to show him, and they brought it to Pastor Tony, and if I remember the story as he was sharing it, right, uh, he looked at the action figure, and he told his boy, he said, this is a glow-in-the-dark figure. And the boy didn't know that, and he was so excited, took it in the bathroom and was excited for about 30 seconds see, looking at this uh, glow-in-the-dark, and then he was disappointed because he came out and he said, ah, oh, Dad, it's broke, I, it needs a new battery. And Tony's like, oh, no, it doesn't need a new battery. Uh, this doesn't run on batteries. That's not how. It is. This is not a toy that generates light. This is a toy that reflects light and, and he showed his son he took the toy and, and they went to a lamp and they just held it to the lamp for a few minutes and then they both went into the dark room and the thing lit up and and there was this sense that was just like wow it absorbed the light and the more it absorbed the light the more it reflected and emanated the light i think it was a great illustration of what's going on here we are not generators of love we are love absorbers we, we all have this fundamental need to be loved. And when you, studies show this, you deprive someone of this need, it leads to consequential problems. And when not being satisfied, we all take that need into relationships. So instead of, when we feel deprived of being loved, we go into relationships instead of being a, somebody who comes with the fruit of love, we come and we drain people. And we measure and assess relationships not on how well we love them, but we assess relationships based on how loved they made us feel. When we root and remain grounded in his love, we are continually absorbing the love of God that he has for us in a way that it fills us, it flows through us, and that it emanates from us. That's what he's saying. He's like, I want you to remain. Uh, I want you to be rooted and remain grounded. I want, that's what I want. And, and, and then John goes on. He says, this is how we know that we live in him. And he in us, spirit of God in us. 
He's given us his spirit. We've seen and testified the Father has sent Jesus, his son, to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges Jesus, the son of God, God lives in them. Spirit, we've talked about this. And they in God. And so we know and rely, remain, put the full weight of our trust on the love God has for us. You can count on his love. Our fruit is tied to our root. Rooting our life. It's not about go try harder. Go produce this fruit. Feel guilty that you're not more loving. It is remaining and rooting my life every day, growing in my understanding of his love for me. So it begs the question, what will that love look like when that fruit shows up? What does it look like? Well, you guessed it. It looks like a whole lot more of Jesus and a whole lot less of me. My guess is I'm not alone. I, I love what Jesus says in John 15. He says, this is my Father's glory that you bear much, what? Fruit. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. He says, as the Father has loved me, this is fascinating. Can you imagine him? As far, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Stay grounded in that love. Stay rooted in that love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. That's a good indication. If you love me, you'll keep my commands just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. He's saying stay rooted in them. Stay grounded in them. Trust the deep love of Jesus. Trust the wide love of Jesus. Uh, rely on the long love of Jesus. Uh, embrace the high love of Jesus. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. See, the fruit is all connected. We're going to talk about joy next week. It's connected. You can't separate them. And that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other. How? How? As I have loved you. If you're taking notes, I want you to write it this way. Spirit filled love is free. Because I don't have to walk into every relationship needing to fill what's deprived in me. When I remain grounded and rooted in his love, it's free to love others the way I'm being loved by Jesus. I'm not free till I'm filled with the fullness of God's love for me. And it's only when I'm rooted and remaining can I experience the freedom to love others the way I'm loved by God. Can I, ever, can I ask you a question? Have you ever rooted your life in the love God has for you found in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross? You see, that's the place to begin. God loves you. Jesus died in your place for your sin. Many of you would say, well, I've done that. Well, what does it look like? What does this fruit look like when it shows up in my life? Oh, we, we're really, really nice people to each other. I have found in my life, I, I, I am, it's a piece of cake for me to be nice to nice people. It, it's a piece of cake for me to love people who love me back. Can I get an amen on that? Piece of cake. But, but what does it look like for you and I when this, when this spirit-filled agape shows up in our life? Let me give you some things. Just do some fruit inspection. I think the first thing that I wrote down in my notes is I got to ask myself some questions. The first one is this, am I free to love in small ways that go unnoticed? The truth is, Paul says that we can do great things with no love, and they mean absolutely nothing. Uh, Mother Teresa had this saying, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. Sometimes we leave a sermon about love, and our, our, our response is to go become an activist for love, to want to do something revolutionary and heroic, as though guilt or grit are going to drive us, and we're going to love Akron and love and we're oh we're gonna just do it but can I tell you something nobody's gonna give mom you an award for loving your kids well nobody's gonna give you an award for caring for your aging parents for eating lunch with the kid who nobody else wants to eat with for helping the neighbor who can't help himself nobody's gonna give you an award but I think the place I gotta begin if I'm gonna love like Jesus am I willing to love in a way that's small Sometimes we pass up small opportunities God gives us because we're looking for a heroic opportunity that others can applaud us for. And all of a sudden, then we're back on that incurvatus. The love is curved back. It's a self-focused love. When I do things to be noticed, even if they're really, really nice things, who am I loving? I'm loving me. How about this question? 
uh, am I willing to sacrificially serve others without looking for a response? Do I instinctively give my life away for the sake of others, or do I keep score? Hey, you owe me one. Uh, I love the fact that Ephesians says this, follow God's example, 5.1 is where this is found. Therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sac sacrifice to God. He says, I want you to love each other the way I loved you and the way he loved us, he gave up his life for us. Sacrificially. Did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. See, sometimes we love each other in a way that looks for response. And who am I really loving? Why are you loving me? Because if I love you, maybe you'll do for me. But when I'm filled with the love of a God who loved me sacrificially, when I couldn't help myself, I can love others out of not a need for them to give something back to me, but out of the overflow that I received from God, what I could never, never have done for myself. You see how that works? How about this? Do I, let's just go deeper and deeper, right? Roots go deeper and deeper. Do I love across borders and boundaries of race, ethnicity, different countries, cultures? I think it's fair to inspect the fruit of my life and see if there's any, any kind of discrimination inside of me and to determine if the fruit of my life reflects the root of my life being rooted in the love of a God. The Bible says, one of the most famous verses, for God so loved the what? The world. That he gave his one and only son. And when you look at the life of Jesus, that his life crossed many boundaries. And I gotta ask myself this, like, oh, Dan, now, now, you're, now you're tiptoeing where you shouldn't be. And I think I'm tiptoeing exactly where I should be. I wonder how I talk about people of other races, ethnicities, from other countries. It can be easy to have an American pride that talks poorly about people from other countries. Uh, maybe because they're in a, even a political system that would be evil. And just to think everybody in that country. It, it, easy to all of a sudden not love the way we're loved by Jesus. Now I'm meddling, I know, but how about this? Am I willing to get messy loving people? Am I willing to get my hands dirty? Am I willing to be inconvenienced? Am I, or do I always have to love on my own terms when it's convenient for me? Jesus' love was willing to get messy, wasn't it? Very rarely was it convenient. And quite often, it got him into hot water, but he loved nonetheless. Sometimes I can make the mistake of thinking God didn't have to get messy loving me. But he is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Messiah who came into my mess to rescue me. And I wonder, sometimes like, ah, I don't want to, I don't know. I don't get my hands dirty. He says, as I have loved you, I want you then to love others. What about this? What about this? Can I love people who disagree with me? Possibly even people who don't like me very probably people who don't believe like me. Jesus said this, I tell you, love your enemies. You see, that's when we know we're producing the fruit, not when we're like, hey man, I love the people I sit beside at church. I love the people that, right? But, but do I love the person who voted different than me? Do I love the person who maybe doesn't even believe like me and makes me feel bad about the way I believe? You see how all of a sudden we're going deeper and deeper? Let's look at one more. Am I willing to love others by absorbing their hurt and offering them forgiveness? Whew. I read this this last week. Roots go deeper when they're under pressure. When there's a drought, it causes a tree's roots to go deeper, searching for moisture. I don't know much that will test your love more than being hurt by somebody, particularly somebody close to you. And what he says is the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the kind of love that can only happen as it experiences the fullness of a God who forgave us when we didn't deserve it. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And that stands in direct contrast to our self-focused, curved-in love. But the way that is produced is this, Spirit-filled love 
is produced is the result of being rooted in and remaining grounded in God's love for us. And so the way that looks is this, when I root my life and remain grounded in his love, I'm now free to love others the way I'm loved by Jesus. When you look at your life, what do you see? Fruit of the Spirit? What's he need to move in, move out? You see more of Jesus, less of you? There's an old, old song I remember as a kid. I don't remember exactly how it goes, but something like this. They will know we are Christians by our love. They'll know we belong to Jesus. They'll know that we're following him, the one who loved us in our mess, the one who loved us even when we had nothing to give back, the one who loved us even when the Bible says we were his enemies. The fruit of the Spirit is love, agape love. What's love got to do with it? Apparently an awful lot. Father, I am grateful for time spent with friends, some of them I've met just even recently, so glad that they watch, so glad they're part of what goes on here. God, I pray for those who don't know Christ that they might right now on their couch, in their car, say, Jesus, I believe you love me, that you died in my place for my sin, and I want to confess you as Savior and Lord of my life. And if you prayed that prayer, email me. Let me know. I'd love to know you gave your heart and life to Christ. But God, there's many of us who've taken this journey and we're followers of Christ. But if we really, really were honest about inspecting our life, we have a, a love that's turned in on ourselves. I'm praying that you would help us to drive our roots deep into your love for us in a way that would grow this love that benefits those around us, this love that somehow is able to show up in hard, challenging times. This love that is predictable because it's a love that is unconditional. It is a love that's extended because it's a love that's experienced. So thanks for challenging us that way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys. Love hanging out with you every week. Dads, have a great Father's Day. I hope you have a great day. Look forward to talking to you next week as we continue this journey together. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Next week. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. God bless you. Have a great week.